going on now last week um, and I understand we're having some technology problems with the video not playing online from last week so I don't know what's going on there I'm going to try and figure that out but uh, today is part two to be or not to be we talked about it's not just about doing it's about being what Christ has called us to be he makes us into a new creation so I want to ask a question this morning that may seem a little off the wall but I want you to consider it with me for a moment what if I were to tell you that without any doubt at all on September 19th of this year the world would end Christ was going to come back rapture the church and the tribulation would start now do I know that date of course not but I'm just picking a date what if on that date the world would end as we know it where does your mind go to if, if you were to really believe okay I, again I'm not trying to prophesy I'm not trying to predict a date I'm just picking a date and there's a reason for that date that date September uh, starting the 18, on the 18th at night nightfall through the 19th is Rosh Hashanah which is uh, the, often thought of as the Jewish New Year it's actually the Jewish Feast of Trumpets when trumpets are blown all day long I mean, you can't hardly walk around without hearing trumpets blowing because it's, it's just reminding people or asking God and remembering, watch for God to reveal himself to us. Watch for God to reveal himself to us. So what if that were September 19th? How would that affect what we do between now and then? Do your thoughts go to some bucket list you have of things? Oh, well, boy, before the end of the world, I want to do this and I want to accomplish this and I want to see this happen. Is that where your mind goes? Or does it go to, oh my goodness, I've got, I've got loved ones that are still lost and don't know the Lord. I've got people I know and care about who are still lost and don't know the Lord. Where do we put our thoughts? Where do they go naturally? Because that tells a lot of who we are. Last week in part one of this message, I, I, I talked about the time of the great tribulation which is coming upon the world. And uh, that it's my belief that we are very, very close to that. And, and I, just, I just want to ask you, you know, this is weird, it's been coming up in conversations a lot lately that I've been having, is people are just saying, Pastor, do you think the end is near? It just feels kind of funny. We look around at everything that's going on in the world, and it just has that kind of, it's like something's about to happen. And I'm having a lot of people tell me that. Now, again, does that mean it's about to happen? No. But what if it is? See, the what ifs are what we have to be aware of. You know, Paul said the Lord's coming is soon other places in the New Testament were told the Lord's coming is soon you know I, I firmly believe earlier in his life at least Paul thought the Lord was going to come back in his time well that was 2,000 years ago and he hasn't come back yet but I believe it's soon and that's how we need to be living that he's coming soon because that tribulation period is coming we need to be ready I, I don't want anyone to have to go through that but, but this message today is not about evangelism it's not about getting your lost friends and neighbors and everything saved it's about you are you ready are you ready for what is coming are you absolutely sure you are ready to meet the Lord because of your faith in Jesus Christ and the life you're living that shows you're truly in Christ and that he is in you that you're really saved or that you're not Paul said, examine yourselves. We talked about that last week. Examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Don't you know that you are unless you fail the test? There, there, we need to look at ourselves. Who are we? So today I want to take this self-examination a little further and to see just how important it is that we're not fooling ourselves. Not by what we think the standards are by which God is going to judge us, but, wait, but by the standards God has said he is going to judge us. And you know, as I've been preparing for this message, we'll just throw up this little scary thought up here. Uh, I have spent a lot of time this week doing research, the last couple of weeks, doing research on the end times. Now, I've studied, of course, extensively over my years as a Christian, but I've been going back and looking at other sources, watching videos, seeing what other pastors and teachers have to say about it. And what I've been impressed with or found very interesting is if you end up on YouTube, which is hard to research anything, and I ended up on YouTube, you will find there are a great number of people out there who are talking about having prophetic dreams and visions of the end of the world very very soon 
Or they are people who say, God is revealing to me from Scripture that the end is very near. And that, indeed, it is coming soon. And what's interesting is that many of these actually are sharing many of the same details. And um, you know, some variations. But what's really amazing to me is that most of them are setting a date no later than... Now, again, they're not trying to pinpoint and say this is... You know, but no later than September 19th of this year. Now, could they be wrong? Absolutely... Am I saying I necessarily believe this timetable that Christ will return by September 19th of this year? No, I'm not saying that. Okay, I don't have a clue when he's going to come back. I believe it soon. What if it were before this service was over? Are we ready to meet him? It could happen. It could happen. I believe it is going to be soon. Now, again, Paul believed that for 2,000 years. We're still waiting for that soon to happen. So am I a prophet that can say this is absolutely going to happen, you know, in the next year or so? You know, many of you knew Harold Knight. Some of you knew Harold Knight. He was a former pastor of this church. Harold Knight believed he would not die until the rapture, that he would live to see the rapture. He was wrong. And if there was a man I have known in my own life who knew end times and the way things should happen, and the whole area of what's called eschatology, the study of the end times, it was Harold Knight. So much so that when I went in for my interview to, be a, to become a pastor in the missionary church, you know, I had to fill out all this long paperwork and all this stuff and go before a review board and you know, all these prestigious big names in the missionary church are there and I'm like shaking in my boots. You know, they're going, well, Pastor Balasa, we see that your formal education in the area of eschatology is somewhat lacking and yet your answers seem to be very full and very correct explaining your views on end times eschatology without taking college courses how have you learned all this and I said well I studied for several years under my pastor Harold Knight and he said oh well if you learn from Harold you're fine <laughs> literally that happened just like that if you learn from Harold you're fine no further questions and he thought he was going to live to see the rapture and he was wrong and if he could be wrong, so can I. But I do believe it is very close. But what I'm trying to get at today, no one knows the day or hour, we know that. Um, but we are told to watch the signs. Watch the signs and see what's happening. Be paying attention to what Scripture teaches. And I think the signs are pointing to it's a very soon coming. But whether it is or is not, we are told to be ready. Because it can be at any time. At any time, Christ could rapture the church. If we're right that it's a pre-tribulation rapture. But at any time, the tribulation could start. What if it's a mid-tribulation rapture? There's a lot of scripture that points to that, that it won't happen until the middle of the tribulation. We're going to go for the first three and a half years. I'm not saying I believe that. I'm saying there's scripture that backs that up. But I'm going to go with Harold Knight and say, I'm voting for the pre-tribulation rapture <laughs> I think it's going to be pre-tribulation pre pre and he says I sure hope so because I have a low threshold for pain <laughs> none of us wants to go through even the first three and a half years the last three and a half years are going to be intolerable we need to be ready so what if his Christ return really is that close if God is about to say enough and bring judgment on the world spoken of throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. If we really believe it is soon, should that not affect the way we are thinking and living? Shouldn't it be affecting who we are, what we're doing? Jesus warned us himself in the book of Luke, just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man, Christ's return. People were eating and drinking, marrying and being given to marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark, then the flood came and destroyed them all. At the time of Noah, most people had no idea what was to come. They really didn't. I mean, we tend to think, well, you know, he built that ark for 100 years and he was a preacher of righteousness. Yes, but by that time, the population of the earth had grown enough and spread out enough. There are people who never would have heard of even Noah. But he tried to get people to know. He tried to get people to understand. But they just, hey, life's going on. Nothing's going to change, right? Life just goes on. We're going to get married. We're going to give him, you know, we're going to be doing all the stuff we normally do. We're going to work. We're going to school. We're going to go visit friends. We're going to go to dinner. We're going to have people over. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to... And it's over. 
That's what happened to them. And that is what's going to happen on the world again. Now we can learn a lot from Scripture about what that time is going to be like or to warn us to get ready for it, to make sure we are ready. Again, this is not a message today about going out and evangelizing the world because if we're right with Christ, we're going to want to do that. So that's not what this message is about. This message is about making sure we are ready. The Apostle John, the Apostle whom Jesus loved, his closest friend on earth when he walked this planet. The Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation as an old man. He was in exile, basically under house arrest. Uh, on an island, a, 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 an island completely barren of trees and vegetation. It's a rocky island. You can't live there without people bringing you supplies. It was a place for political prisoners to be sent uh, in exile. And that's where John is. He's in exile on this island. And while he's there, God gives him visions or revelations of things to come. And he wrote them down in what we call the book of Revelation, the last book of our Bible. They're given to him by Jesus, these revelations. And among the many visions he received, many of them were about the great tribulation which was about to come upon the earth that God was going to send. And a couple chapters of that book are dedicated to messages he had to seven churches that were spread around basically the Roman world, the known world at that time, regions of the world, messages to them to warn them to be ready, that he is coming soon, be ready for my coming. Now, that is written to seven churches that actually existed at the time. But most scholars still agree it's also symbolic of various things throughout church history. And the teaching to those churches applies to us today. I mean, we're given scripture. You know, Paul would say, you know, he writes a letter to Ephesus. He says, make sure you send this to Thessalonica and read the letter I sent to Thessalonica. They learn from each other. And so we can learn from these letters to these churches as to how we're supposed to live. And the first one I want to read about is found in Revelation chapter 3, beginning with verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I'm rich, I've acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. See, you think you got it all together, church. This is written to a church, remember that. You think you've got it all together. You think you've got all you need. You think you're on target. But in reality, you're completely missing the mark. And he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. He's warning us, get ready. There's things going to happen to you if you're not ready. So be earnest and repent. And then the hope that comes from this passage, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Church, you're not where you think you are. Church, you're not where you're supposed to be. But you know what? If you will knock on the door, if you will invite me in, I will come in and make you what you're supposed to be. And you will be what you are supposed to be. Because I can do that for you. God is loving and patient for us to choose him, but he doesn't want us living under misconceptions of being his followers if we are not. So the big question is, how cold or hot or lukewarm are we? And how are we really to know? You know, if we consider ourselves Christians, maybe we should ask ourselves a simple question, who is really in control of our life? Because that's what Lord means. Who is really in control of our lives? Is it ourselves or God's Holy Spirit? When I hear the world may end, do I think of my bucket list or do I think of other people who need to come to Christ before it's too late? Strange as it may seem, again, I'm not talking about reaching the lost right now. I'm talking about us being ready to make sure that our relationship with Jesus is that of being our true Lord and Savior, that He is in control of everything. If we're doing that, the witnessing will follow because we'll want other people to know Jesus. We'll want other people to come to Him. To be or not to be? 
Are we being who God called us and created us to be or not? That's what counts. The Apostle Peter who wrote to God's elect, strangers in the world. So again, what, what I'm about to read from the Apostle Peter is not just written in general to the populace. It's written to God's elect. I mean, this is to the church. Those people who call themselves believers in Jesus Christ. And Peter says, his divine power, Jesus' divine power, has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them we may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Amen, right? That's the good part. Yes, through Christ we have the power, we have the authority, we have all we need to escape the evil things of the world and to be godly, holy people here on earth. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love does that sound like another list I read last week the fruit of the spirit right the fruit of the spirit shows who we are work on those things just desire to become more and more of what God wants us to be for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, amen, great, that's fantastic. But then there's that little but that he threw in there, you know. But, if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. These are the things that say you're a Christian. These are the things that should be flowing out of us. That is the fruit that we are to bear that lets the world know we are in Christ and he is in us. But if we're not seeing those things in our lives, <clears throat> there's a problem. And we need to be examining ourselves. Why not, Lord? What's going on here? Who am I? Why am I not what I'm supposed to be? We bear fruit in keeping with the Spirit. We repent of those things that are not pleasing to God. And we try to be a Spirit-filled believe, spirit believer, one who invites the Spirit to live in us and through us. As Paul said to the church at Ephesus, be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you... There must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. And, and I, I got to tell you, you know, many places the New Testament warns us about controlling the tongue. James talks about controlling the tongue. We read last week about, you know, with the, with the mouth, we, we praise our God and yet we curse our brother. And this should not be. There's all these references to what we say. And you know what? As Christians who are truly spirit-filled, we, we should not be having foolish talk and coarse joking come out of our mouths. Now, that doesn't mean we can't joke around a little bit. That's what I mean. But coarse joking, the, in, the improper things, the things that are offensive, the things that are worldly. Those really have no place in our lives. We shouldn't have them. Every word that comes out of our mouth should be to build others up, to be pleasing, to, to reflect Christ in our lives. And we've got to be careful. Again, what, what do we see when we examine ourselves? Going on. For this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. If this is who you are, just like we read last week in Galatians. He gives that whole list. And he says, I warned you as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he says, if you're living this way, you're an idolater and you do not have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. And this is written to a church, to Christian people, that he wants us to realize you may be sitting there in the pew or on the chair or on the floor, wherever they sit at that time, 
and you think I've got it all together I'm rich I lack nothing I am in Christ and everything is great and the truth is you're not you're fooling yourself or Satan is fooling you or whatever is fooling you but we need to be honest and accept that if you're truly in Christ you're going to live a life that reflects Christ because that's who you are in fact, he goes on to say, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Let no one give you false hope. Let no one give you false assurance or security that you can live the way the world lives and still be in Christ. It doesn't work that way. You're in Christ or you're not in Christ. It's who you are, not just what you do. We've got to be ready. We need to make sure we're right. What comes out of us comes from what is within us. It's not about doing, excuse me, it's about being. It's about being a follower of Jesus Christ. And who we are is going to determine and affect our worldview and everything around us. Worldview we don't hear a lot about anymore. We did for a while. But, you know, um, worldview is the way we see the world. You know, you, you've probably heard the comments like, well, there's no such thing as unbiased reporting. There's no such thing as an unbiased story. There's no such, you know, we all have our biases. We, we do, every single one of us. We all have our biases. And it comes from our world view, how we see the world. Do we see the world from the world's perspective? Do we see the world from God's perspective? What sets our priorities? Because my world view determines how I treat my spouse and my friends and my coworkers. It determines how I raise my children, how I support godly causes or worldly causes. It determines how I vote. It determines what I post on social media, how I spend my money, my time, and my talents. In other words, my world view is going to come out of me in a way that's going to let you see who I really am. What do people see when they look at you? What's your world view? And that's not about just something you choose to do. It's because of this is who you are. So what is your worldview? Because that will tell a lot about who is in charge. Who is your Lord? You know, personally, I'm of the opinion. Don's going to love this one. I can't be a Christian and support anyone or anything that supports abortion. I can't. That's not loving. It's not kind. It's not protecting the young and the innocent. I can't. I got asked in a survey the other day. Somebody knocked on my door. You know, go to the door. You know what? You know what's going on? They were uh, there for a particular political uh, person. You're running for office here coming up this week in the elections, uh, the primaries, and uh, they held up a list and said, "Okay, here, here's a list of issues that may be important to you." This was a conservative candidate, so they're all conservative issues. Here's a list of issues that may be of importance to you. Which one of these would you say is the most important? And I looked through the list and went, well, important, 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 important. He said, I said, they're all important. He said, but which was the most important to you? I said, I've got to say pro-life. Because if a person will not support protecting a child in the womb, I can't trust anything else they're going to do. And it's not only that, everything begins with life. Everything. So what's the most important issue? Protecting the young, innocent lives. To me. And I'm saying yours has to be exactly the same as mine. I'm just sharing what to me came across this week as very, very, very important. Because my world view determines what I say, what I do, who I vote for, and everything else. It has to. Because it will. Period. That's my bias. My worldview. And unfortunately, there's too many Christians who say, I'm a Christian and, and I love the Lord. You know, Jesus is my Lord. He's the one that controls what I do. But their worldview is diametrically opposed to the teaching of Scripture in so many areas. And they see nothing wrong with it. You know, in, in Matthew, Jesus said, These people honor me with. Actually, this is quoting from the Old Testament. God says, These people honor me with their lips. But their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. 
They go to church. They go through the rituals. They are, they're religious people. But they're not there. They're not really with me. Spirit-filled people do what the Spirit leads them to do. Worldly people does what the world links that leads them to do. It's not about what we do. It's about who we are. Because who we are determines what we do. And this is serious stuff. I mean, Matthew, man, this passage just nailed me this week and, and gave me such a, a burden for the people of the churches of America and around the world who think they've got it all together, who think they're right with Christ, but are not following Him. Not really. And they're really just lost people trying to behave like Christians. And he said, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Do, do, do. Did we not do this? Did we not do this? Did we not do that? And he said, Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. It's not just about doing, it's about being. And if I'm not being who Christ wants me to be, then maybe Christ really is not in me, and I need to get serious and say, Lord, come and fill me with your presence, with your spirit, and help me to truly walk a life and live a life honoring to you. This message is perhaps one of the most important things I could ever say to any church anywhere. Make sure you're really walking what you think you're walking. Some people, I'm afraid, are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ someday in heaven and say, Lord, I taught Sunday school, or I worked in the nursery, or I served meals at my church, or, well, Lord, I gave to missions, or, or to those relief ministries like Samaritan's Purse, or, well, when those commercials came on TV, you know, of all the suffering to the children's hospitals, whatever, I gave. Well, Lord, I, I, I gave a lot to the church. I helped pay off the mortgage. I served on the church board. I was a deacon or a trustee or I sang in the choir or worship team. Or I taught at seminary. Or I pastored churches. And we're going to hear, they're going to hear, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. If we don't know Christ, if he does not know us, we're fooling ourselves. And we're not going to go to heaven and if we're right and the rapture's coming soon you're going to find yourself wondering where did the rest of my church friends go and it's going to hit you I guess I wasn't ready after all and again there's going to be church pastors and seminary professors and everything else in that category they know better they know they know it up here but they don't know Christ it blows my mind when I'm talking to a pastor I've had this happen to me talking to a pastor who's been pastor for like 40 years only to have him say I just found out what it really means to accept Christ I've been talking the talk even walking the walk but I didn't know Christ wow what a difference Jesus makes it happens all the time shouldn't it does Are you lukewarm? Are you hot? Are you cold? Where are you at? You know, if we want to keep the fire burning, if we want to stay hot for Christ, there's a couple things we've got to do, and one of them is you've got to keep adding fuel to the fire. You know, that's one thing I learned back in my days as a Boy Scout. Three fingers, right? Boy Scouts. My days as a Boy Scout is if you want to keep a good fire going, you've got to keep adding fuel to the fire. And if you get a nice roaring fire going at night before you go to bed, and you get up in the morning, that fire is going to be out because somebody has to tend that fire during the night. Or it's going to go out on you. If you have a fireplace, wood burner, whatever, you know that. You've got to keep putting fuel in the fire because what used to be enough is no longer enough. It burns up. And what used to be enough for me to do, I've got to keep doing more. I can't just say, oh, I remember back when I was young and I did this and I did that and I did the other thing and boy, God moved in mighty ways and it was just a wonderful thing. No. Yeah. When was that? Oh, about 35, 40 years ago. Well, what's he been doing in your life lately? Well, I remember also about 35 or 40 years, this happened to go, you know, happened and everything. Okay, what's he been doing lately? 
Well, I went to a prayer meeting a few weeks back. Anything happened? No. Fell asleep, actually. <laughs> Where are we at? Are, are, are we on fire for Christ? Because if we're not fueling the fire, we're not going to stay on fire. And the other thing I learned about fire, you know, you, isn't it great? You know, you, you, every scout knows, you know, you start with a little tinder, you get that little fire going, you put some twigs on it, and then you put some little bit bigger logs, you know, little branches on it, and then finally you get to the point where you put the big logs on there, you know, because they burn a long time, and you get a great fire going and everything else. But what happens if you take one of those logs that's really burning and on fire, and you roll it out of the fire? It goes out, doesn't it? That great big log was just burning brightly and so impressive, it just kind of goes off the side, and if it was really burning well enough, its embers will stay kind of hot in there or warm, and it'll smoke for a long time. But it's going to go out because we need each other. We need each other. I had a man tell me this week, I don't need to be in church. I can pray outside in God's great wilderness and I can see his glory out there and I don't need to be in church. I don't need church people. I don't need some preacher standing up there telling me I'm supposed to live. I am fine just going out and praying with God and I do and I don't need anything else. Well, I'm sorry, Scripture says you do. Scripture says you do. We need each other. Even during COVID. Hebrews, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. What day? The day of Christ's return. The day of the rapture. We need to be encouraging each other. Supporting each other. Helping each other stand. I owe it to you and you owe it to me. We belong to each other. Remember I preached on that a couple weeks ago. We belong to each other. We need to be here for each other all the time. We need to live our lives in Christ. I read last week Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's what motivates me. That's what controls me. That's my worldview. And if I want to fan that flame and keep that fire burning bright, then I've got to figure out what's going to make that work for me. And I'll give you a suggestion. Share your faith with people and watch them come to Jesus Christ as their Savior. I don't have anything else in my life that's gotten me more excited more often than to see someone actually come to Christ. Or if not that, maybe your thing is teaching. Okay, disciple someone. Disciple someone. Maybe it's a young believer who, who's just not, he's still trying to figure out what life is all about, but you can go and help them grow and you see that light bulb keep coming on, that discovery. Oh, you mean Christ did this for me? Oh, you mean I can do this for him? Oh, you mean he's giving me these gifts that I can do. Oh, wow, oh, you know, it's just exciting to watch that. You know? That kind of thing gets us excited, but to just set and not do anything, log's going to go out. We've got to have something to keep us going. Get excited. Get involved in ministry. Serve the Lord. Final passage here this morning. Begin back to the book of Revelation. John's writing from the Revelations, the visions that God gave him there on the island of Patmos while he was in exile. Writing to the seven churches, another of the churches, this time the church in Ephesus. And he says, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. That's good, right? I know your deeds. I know what you're doing. I know how hard you're trying to do what is good and right. Compliment to this church at Ephesus. Wonderful at this point. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Wow, another great pat on the back. Church, you've done well. And they had. Church, you've done well. You've been true to Scripture. You don't allow false apostles to come in and teach you things that aren't true. You've been true to Scripture. You've been true to each other. You've been what you're supposed to be. And I commend you for that. Yet... That's kind of like that but word, but it's yet. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. What's your first love? Jesus. You see, you're going through the motions. You're doing things, but you stop being. You've forsaken me. You've forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. 
Remember what it was like when you were first saved. Remember what it was like when you first found out what, what Christ had done for you, how much he loved you, that he would die on that cross for you. Remember what that was like and your desire to let other people know what Jesus had done for you and what he will do for them. Repent. Repent of what? I'm doing all the good stuff. Yeah, repent of doing it for the, without remembering your first love. Repent of doing it in your own strength. Repent and do the things you did at first. Boy, I spent some time on this passage, personally. Read through the book of Revelation this week. Boy, some fantastic stuff in there. But I spent a lot of time on this passage. Do the things you did at first. And remembering what it was like to be a young Christian man. And first time I got asked to teach a Sunday school class. An assistant Sunday school teacher. I was going to have somebody teach me how to teach a Sunday school class. And... and uh, to sit there under his teaching and how nervous I was. Never taught before, you know. But God said, do this. And I said, okay. And I did it. And then, Rich Whitmer, Pete Nursley knows him well. Um, Rich Whitmer, who was teaching me to be a teacher, went off to the mission field. And I got left with teaching the class. <laughs> kind of where uh, <laughs> Marsu is right now. <laughs> um, but, you know, suddenly I found out how to be a teacher. And I, I like what you said, you know, life begins when we step out of our comfort zone. I think it was something like that you said. I like that. At the end of our comfort zone. Okay, life begins at the end of our comfort zone. And throughout my life, and I don't think it's because I'm a pastor. I think it's just God works in each one of us different ways. But throughout my life, it's every time I've gotten comfortable, God's had something else for me and something else for me and something else for me where I've had to say God I've got no choice but to trust you no choice but to trust you because I don't have a clue what's next I don't have a clue what I'm going to be doing next I don't have a clue how to do next what you got me to do but I'm going to trust you and we trust him and that rekindles that spark again that reminds us that you remember the height in which you have fallen do the things you did at first if you do not repent I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place that's the last thing you want to have happen. He's telling the church, if you don't quit just playing the game, this is a Brian Balassa interpretation here, okay? But I think it's fairly accurate. He's telling the church that's been faithful and true and biblically accurate and all these things. He's telling, if you don't quit playing the game, if you don't quit just going through the motions, if you don't quit just being a country club that's doing good things... I'm going to just write you off. I'm going to just write you off. I'm going to, because that lampstand represents the Spirit of God in your presence. The seven lampstands are the seven spirits of God, the sevenfold Spirit of God. And he says, I'm going to remove your lampstand if you don't go back to where, what you're doing, what you're supposed to be doing. It's not the things you're doing, it's who you are. And if you are who you're supposed to be, you will do those things, but for the right reasons. Don't do them just to do them. And I fear we're too guilty of that too often in our churches in America. And I don't want any of us to be there. I'm going to do something I haven't done in a while. We're going to have an altar call this morning. And we don't have any music. I guess, Dave, if you can maybe find just something you can let play. Um, sorry, Dave, I didn't give you a heads up on that. And with all the technology problems we've had this morning, that's really unfair to him. But I, I just feel absolutely committed. We need to do an altar call this morning. Because if, if, as I've been talking today, you have been maybe convicted you're not where you should be and that you're not in a relationship with Christ that you should be in right now. I'm not talking about before. I'm talking about right now. And maybe you need to come up here, kneel at the altar or sit in these front pews if you can't kneel, and just ask God to get that fire stirred up again in you. To help you not be lukewarm, but to be on fire for Him. Hot for God. Because if the time is short, as I believe it to be, could be wrong, but you know what? What if I am? We're still told to be ready. It could happen at any time. And it could. Whether I'm right or wrong, it doesn't matter. Christ is coming back, and it could be at any time. And yes, it could be that I'm right and it's going to be very soon I want to be ready 
And I want you to be ready. I'm going to pray. The elders are going to be open. If you would like to come and pray and get right with God, whatever that may mean to you in this moment. No one's going to judge you. I, right? None of us are going to judge anybody else. I'm going to rejoice for anybody that comes forward who says, I need to get things right. I need to get things back on track with God. I rejoice in that. I can't tell you how many trips I've made to the altars over the years. I'm going to pray, and if you feel led, please come up, recommit your life to Christ. Ask Him to stir that thing up, to remind you of what He's done for you. To get that fire burning, we call that revival. Ask Him to bring revival to you. That you'll still make a difference in the time we have left. We'll pray. Dave, if you want to just throw on some music when you've got it back there. And um, the altars are open. Feel free to come forward. Father, you know how hard this message has been for me to prepare this week because I've had to do some very, very deep searching. And I've had all week, actually the last two weeks, to be reflecting on these things. Father, I'm ashamed at how I've allowed the flame to die down over the years at different times. But I'm so thankful that you stand at the door and knock and if we will open that door you will come in and eat with us and we with you. Lord, that you'll rekindle that fire. You'll help us to be what you want us to be. Lord, that it won't be work to serve you. It won't be hard to serve you. It won't be a sacrifice to serve you because we're having to give up the things that we want, the things about us, the thing the world says is important because we will just rejoice in being able to serve our God, to know that you are pleased with us. Or do a work in all of our lives. If the fire is burning bright, may it continue to burn bright. May you help those flames just be fanned ever brighter than they were before. Lord, for anybody who might be cold, I pray they would yet accept Christ and give their life to Him, to you. Lord, if we're just lukewarm, may we heed the warnings. Say, Lord, I want to put the world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back. Fill me with your spirit, with your presence. Help me to live a life pleasing to you. Becoming more and more of what you want me to be every day. Never going back. Lord, your will be done in this church. And your will be done in our lives. As the time is getting closer. May we be ready. May we be doing the work you've called us to do when you come. Help us, Lord, because of who we are. To reach out to the world that's dying and lost around us. Seek to bring them to you. Help us do this all for your glory. Your will to be done in Jesus' name. Amen.